FEMA TO TELL YOUR STORIES. YOU'RE WATCHING ANTIQUES ROADSHOW ON WEST VIRGINIA PUBLIC BROADCASTING. BECOME A SUSTAINER TODAY. YOU'RE WATCHING WEST VIRGINIA PUBLIC BROADCASTING. From West Virginia Public Broadcasting. Support for the legislature today is provided by AARP West Virginia, your ally for real possibilities in the Mountain State. Learn more at aarp.org wv. The Charleston Gazette Mail, using its CGM app to deliver the latest news, traffic, and weather alerts, keeping you in the know while you're on the go. Lumos Networks, online at lumosnetworks.com. Marshall University, with more than 100 degree programs offered in four locations and online. More about the Marshall family at marshall.edu. Orion Strategies, professional public relations, government affairs, creative services, and research and polling with offices in Charleston, Buchanan, Martinsburg, Pittsburgh, and Columbus. Good evening and welcome to the Legislature Today. Tonight, the Senate President and House Speaker will join us for a conversation on multiple issues. But first, both political parties want to fix a stalled medical marijuana program. But as Dave Mistich reports, House Democrats are also pushing for the legalization of marijuana's recreational use. West Virginia's medical marijuana program is set to kick off on July 1st. But technical flaws in state code dealing with banking and other issues stand in the way. A measure that would have ironed out those details died on the final night of session last year. Then House Speaker Tim Armstead failed to take up the bill after it passed in the Senate. A lot of banks won't handle the money that medical marijuana businesses bring in because the drug is illegal on the federal level. Attorney General Patrick Morrissey issued an opinion Friday that said while Congress hasn't allocated funding for law enforcement to target medical marijuana businesses, that's not guaranteed into the future. Morrissey wrote that while states cannot fully mitigate the risk for banks and other financial institutions, they can help lessen the concerns by helping whomever is handling the money comply with currently existing federal protections. Since the original law was put in place back in 2017, lawmakers and the state's treasurer's office have been pushing for a cleanup of the state's medical marijuana program. Delegate Mike Pushkin is one of those lawmakers. First and foremost, we need to address the banking issue. Uh, it is uh, my proposal uh, that we open up the bidding process to include credit unions as well as banks and other financial institutions to act as a depository for state funds. Uh, so the potential uh, businesses that are going to be coming to the state could apply for those licenses and that application fee could go to also go to a credit union or a bank. But Pushkin argues that the legislature shouldn't stop with legalizing marijuana for medical use. I think that uh, adults in West Virginia should have the right whether or not to choose whether or not they want to use this plant. But also if you're talking about revenue, and I know the, the governor had a lot of big proposals in his state of the state the other night, and all of those proposals come with a pretty hefty price tag. Well, we would like to be on the side of fiscal responsibility, and we are proposing a new revenue stream that people would choose to pay if they wanted to. A 2016 report from the West Virginia Center on Budget and Policy shows that if marijuana was legalized for adult recreational use and taxed at a rate of 25 percent, the state could collect an estimated $45 million annually upon full implementation. 
That same report says that if 10 percent of marijuana users who live within a 200 mile radius of West Virginia came here to purchase marijuana and were taxed at the same rate of 25 percent, an estimated $194 million could be brought in each year. Delegate Sean Fluharty is another Democrat who has been publicly supportive of recreational marijuana. With West Virginia declining in population, he sees recreational legalization as a means to stop outward migration and potentially grow the state's tax base. Look at all the other states. Colorado, they've been increasing population. Nevada had the biggest increase in population, I believe, this past year after they went adult-use cannabis. We have other neighboring states saying they're going to enter the market. Governor from Pennsylvania said they're about ready to move forward with that legislation. So our neighbors are already out-competing us. We're a state where we could have a reasonable monopoly. Governor Justice and Republican leaders in both chambers have made repealing the business inventory tax a top priority. But the time frame and to what effect is unknown. There's talk of a phase-out over the course of years, and the loss of revenue depends on whether the repeal would apply to manufacturing equipment or all other types of businesses. To get the measure passed, they'll need Democrats on board to secure a two-thirds majority in both chambers, and then it's still left in the hands of the general public to vote to amend the state constitution. The real hang-up is finding an alternative funding mechanism for public education, which receives its funding from the business inventory tax. Democrats in the House of Delegates say there's already a model for that. In their 2017-2018 budget year, Colorado directed more than $90 million of tax revenue from its marijuana sales toward its Department of Education. With that in mind, Fluharty sees recreational marijuana as a bargaining chip for Democrats to get fully on board with the inventory tax repeal, especially given new spending proposals from the governor. I think there's a potential for that because when we start crunching the numbers, we're going to realize we're not going to get to the finish line that they want to get to without a new revenue stream like uh, adult use cannabis. House Finance Chair Eric Householder is less enthusiastic about the prospects for recreational. He's also keeping in mind where West Virginia currently stands on the medical program. With state law prohibiting taxes on prescription medication, the state stands at best to more or less break even on the medical marijuana program. Yeah, I don't think we're quite there yet on the recreational marijuana within the Republican caucus. But like I said, uh, I get inundated with emails all across, you know, from people in the state wanting me to support you know, adult cannabis use. Uh, The medicinal uh, marijuana, I did support uh, back when we passed it. And keep in mind, I am a little concerned we have $2.4 million this year alone in the budget for a medical marijuana office, medicinal marijuana office. And last year we did a $600,000 supplemental. So we're about three, almost $3 million into this and we haven't made one red nickel yet. As for adult recreational use, House Democrats see that potential revenue as a way to fill at least a portion of a potential gap in public education funding that would be caused by the proposed rollback on the business inventory taxes. But Householder says he would have different plans for any revenue brought in by recreational marijuana sales, in line with his ideas for other so-called sin taxes. I would have a different path for that revenue. One of the decisions or one of the uh, ideas that I have this year is any revenue from gaming or gambling bills that are ran, I'd like to drive that revenue to a personal income tax reduction fund. I would do the same with any of the recreational marijuana if it, had, if it ever passes. Over in the Senate, top Republicans like President Mitch Carmichael have come out in opposition to legalization for recreational use, but they do support a fix to the state's medical program. New Senate Majority Leader Tom Takubo is a pulmonologist in Kanawha County. He's focused not only on the banking issue, but also tweaks to the medicinal program that would benefit patients. Takubo says he'd like to implement recommendations from an advisory board established through the State Department of Health and Human Resources that's been tasked with overseeing the medical marijuana program. Number one priority is how to fix the the banking issue with um, medicinal marijuana. Uh, The other question would be, is there going to be more discussion about um, broadening that up a little bit? So right now uh, you can rub oils, I think, on you, but you can't uh, uh, inhale it and you can't ingest it uh, for medical purposes. The legislature laid out a very specific set of criteria uh, two years ago when we passed the bill. Um, Cancer, um, multiple sclerosis, some pretty serious conditions. Um, those conditions, uh, from a medical standpoint, would probably do better if things were inhaled or ingested. As a physician treating patients with best practices based on published science, Takubo points out that marijuana's federal status as a Schedule One substance limits government-backed research on the subject. So far, 10 states in the District of Columbia have legalized the drug for recreational use. 
While many critics say that public sentiment is outpacing research on marijuana's effects, even Republicans say that West Virginia's day for recreational is inevitable. House Finance Chair Eric Householder says he's willing to discuss the issue, but also points to some potential roadblocks in the short term. Absolutely, I am open, but we also heard the governor state during the state of the state that he was opposed to recreational marijuana. Uh, it is a touchy situation. I know sooner or later it's coming. Uh, when, I, I can't predict it. Obviously, if I had a crystal ball, I would tell you when that date is. With Attorney General Patrick Morrissey issuing an opinion last week on the federal banking issues, lawmakers in the Treasurer's office seem poised to find a path forward for West Virginia's medical marijuana program. But the potential for legislation dealing with adult recreational remains questionable. Whether it's this session or in 2020 during an election year, when campaigning will be a big factor, moving policy beyond medical into recreational marijuana will almost certainly depend on political bargaining. For the Legislature Today, I'm Dave Mistich at the Capitol. Joining us now are Senate President Mitch, M Mitch Carmichael and Speaker of the House Roger Hanshaw. Thank you both for being here today. It's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, Mr. Speaker, let's begin with you. you. You asked the Attorney General for the opinion. You got it Friday. Um, what is the path forward now I, I for did, the medical marijuana bill? Sure, I did seek the opinion at the direction of the Joint Health Committee that met over the summer. That committee asked that I, on its behalf, submit a request to the Attorney General for the opinion that General Morrissey gave on Friday. I think that most of us who've read it are of the opinion that it was sort of an as expected opinion that that no matter what we do and what steps we take we can't eliminate all elements of risk in the program what i liked about the opinion was that general morrissey did lay out some options for us to consider so our our house committee on banking and insurance this session is taking up in great detail the, the issue of what to do about the so-called banking problem here. Can, can you briefly and very broadly, though, tell us what those, uh, what those paths forward, forward may be? Well, at the very highest level. So, some of, so they include things like the, the so-called closed loop system where the state uh, institutes a, a sort of a, an exchange where, where the products are bought and sold using uh, what we think of as gift cards. There, there are proposals that the state itself enter into a bank or, or, or charter a state bank. There, there are other proposals that allow the state to expand its scope of depositories to include credit unions, some of which fall outside the scope of, of some of the other banking regulations at the federal level that are inhibitory here for the program. So our, our banking committee has all of those under consideration. They have General Morrissey's opinion and I've spoken to Chairman Nelson about that. They, they have, have already begun to dig into it. All right, and President Carmichael, we've we've heard about uh, we've heard that House uh, House Democrats are are pushing for uh, legalization of for recreational use. You've uh, you've stated that uh, that you're opposed to it. Uh, uh, just elaborate on that uh, on that stance. Well, for one, uh, West Virginia has, uh, and in fact, the country has a <laughs> drug problem, uh, and I don't feel there's any need to exacerbate that with uh, the full recreational use of what is currently an illegal drug. Now I am 100 percent and the Senate uh, was a leader in the aspect of utilizing uh, all forms of uh, medical marijuana for relief of suffering of people who uh, have a legitimate need for it. But in terms of recreational use, I mean, one would think, uh, listening to our friends on the other side of the aisle, that this whole legislative session is about some way to utilize uh, marijuana. And uh, that's, we have so many big issues in this state that are facing us. The uh, opportunities that we have in education and business and jobs and opportunities, uh, for them to be so myopic in their view about uh, the use of recreational marijuana. I mean, I was interested in watching some of your clips here that were uh, being shown about, you know, people standing around uh, just uh, utilizing uh, recreational marijuana. And in this state, at this time, uh, in this day and age with the drug problem we have in our state, I just don't, uh, you know, there may come a day, but I do not see that as a path forward in West Virginia for prosperity. All right, and, and Mr. Speaker, I'd like you to, to comment um, as well. We heard uh, your finance chair, uh, uh, Chairman Householder, say that you know he's absolutely open to discussing it 
and he also said that it, it that sooner or later it's on its way. Recreational use. Y yes, he did. Uh, I, what what, well, what, it, what part of that should it, I comment on? Well, what is your stance? You have we have House of Delegate members on both sides. We do. Yes. I, I suppose I'm where President Carmichael is. I, I I hesitate to head our state down a pathway where we are under the under the seal of the state saying that it's okay to engage in what is a known illegal activity. So there, there are states who have made that, that policy choice uh, for, for the, from the perspective of investors and business owners and entrepreneurs here in West Virginia. I hesitate to say that we should encourage them to participate in what is known illegal activity. And Ro Roger's absolutely right on that. I mean, whether or not we personally condone it or not, it's a federally illegal product. Um, and so to condone that with the seal of West Virginia's approval in a, in a state in which we're experiencing such a drug epidemic uh, would seem to me the wrong path at the wrong time. Well, I, I'd like to then link into or, or move into the business inventory tax. Now, they, it is, was mentioned by uh, House members that, you know, if, if, if you're willing to support a recreational uh, uh, recreational marijuana use, that money could be tapped and go, go to public education, uh, whereas the, you know, the business and inventory tax would be taken away and that money would be lost. Uh, comments there. Sure. Let's, let's not get the cart ahead of the horse in the conversation about the, the equipment and inventory tax, because the very first step that has to happen before any, any measure that tax goes away is that the voters have to approve a constitutional amendment which actually unties the hands of the legislature and until that happens every other proposal is 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 moot in fact it, it, it isn't even it isn't even on the table for consideration so what we are considering this session is a proposal that simply does that which unties the hands of the legislature and makes it possible at a future time for the legislature to undo that tax. That proposal will cost zero dollars, will cost not, not one penny to a local government, not one penny to a school system, not one penny to the state. So that's, that's the prudent step that we think is in, is in order at this time. And, and Senator, do you think that should it get to a vote of the people that there is uh, an appetite to, to roll back taxes on Corporations. Well, what I will say is uh, for many years, uh, for probably 30 years, this tax, the tax system in West Virginia has been studied. And uh, invariably, the results come back to say the number one job killing tax in this state is the uh, personal property tax on business inventory and equipment that doesn't exist in our surrounding states such that people can invest in other states and not pay that tax. So I'm not for cutting willy-nilly uh, corporate taxes, but when it generates jobs and opportunities such that it creates more uh, revenue for the state, then certainly one should look at this. And what I will say is the, the uh, sort of the veiled implication that uh, the, our friends on the other side of the aisle, who I love dearly, would trade uh, the uh, business and inventory tax that's killing jobs and opportunities in our state for the ability to use recreational marijuana is a, is a deal that I don't think uh, stands uh, up to proper scrutiny. All right, I'd like to move on and, and talk more about economic development and, and growing jobs. Um, Mr. Speaker, let me begin with you. What is the focus in the hardest hit areas of, of our state, of Southern West Virginia? You represent Clay County. Yes. And we know the poverty rate is the latest, I, I believe, is at 27%, almost 25% of residents that are younger than 65 are disabled, your, your constituents. And so when there isn't a, a large economic engine in, in Clay County, what is the Republican plan this session? What sp specific um, priorities or incentives will, will address that? Sure. I, I like to tell people that, that I represent a three-county area without a stoplight, a Walmart, or a McDonald's. And I say that because it really frames the conversation about what economic development means in the various parts of our state. I have been to grand openings for businesses in my district that are employing three to five people. 
and we're happy about that because that's three to five more people than we had before. But it also underscores how different the conversation about economic development is in some of the more rural parts of our state than in some of what we'd consider to be our urban centers. We are happy to join with the Senate this session and really double down on workforce training. We know that we have among the lowest rates of entrepreneurial activity in the country. We know that we have the lowest workforce participation rate in the country. And a big part of that comes from the fact that help is not on the way, that outside, outside influence and outside investment in West Virginia is is not coming at the pace that we've expected. It's not coming at the pace that that for d generations now we've been promised. I, I will soon be 39 years old and in my lifetime I, I have heard little more than if we just hold on a little bit longer something's going to come save us. If we just hold on a little bit longer some, someone's going to come here and rescue West Virginia. They haven't come. What we know is we have to incentivize people who have made West Virginia their home by choice to be able to start and grow a business here. We're, we're, we're anxious that the Senate has passed a significant workforce training bill. We are anxious to get to work on that bill also. We know we have jobs here that, that need to be done. We know we have jobs that need to be filled. And we also know we have a significant opportunity for people who want to be entrepreneurs and do entrepreneurial activity here to start small businesses in our communities. But they have to have skills to do it. I, I want to take a moment right now. We're going to hear from someone who was in the Senate Education Committee, uh, the uh, Community and Technical College Bill. Uh, was reported out of that committee. It's now in, uh, in Senate Finance, but let's go ahead and take a listen to her. As a TANF coordinator at Bridge Valley, I see students come in um, with all kinds of barriers and um, how they're going to put food on the table, how they're going to make it to, the, to their next uh, paycheck. And what this bill would mean to them would be less stressful um, having to do all of that. They could just come to school and get their education and graduate with that degree and find a career and provide for their families. Um, what it would also mean, I think, for community colleges throughout the state would be um, enrollment, uh, more enrollment. Um, Senate Bill 1, you, uh, it, it's back by popular demand mm -hmm. from last year. Um, this is really something that you have shepherded through, and uh, what are your thoughts about getting it through the House this year? Well, I'm so excited to work with my colleagues in the House to, to change the lives of West Virginians, because this bill does that. Uh, as my friend the Speaker just mentioned, that we have this low workforce participation rate in West Virginia, and we have the lowest educational attainment level in America, one of. This bill changes that. It, we are leaving currently so many federal dollars on the table by not having a program like this. We can grab um, many of these federal retraining dollars uh, and then the state will kick in the very last dollar. And these people that receive this, uh, per are able to participate in this program, can then develop a stackable skill set that makes them a productive member of society. They can fill these jobs that we have in our state and grow our revenue and jobs and opportunities. And it is not free by any mechanism. The people must submit to a drug test, they must provide community service hours, and they must live and work in West Virginia today. President Trump tweeted out that the city of Chattanooga just received an $800 million investment from Volkswagen. The, the state of Tennessee uses this very program to attract those kind of employers. This is what can happen in West Virginia, and I'm so excited that it passed Senate education. I'm, I feel certain it'll pass the Senate soon and be favorably received in the House. Well, Mr. Speaker, let's, let's get your uh, response to that. Um, you have said that uh, you're broadly interested in, in of course, that, uh, that goal, but you weren't quite sure that the CTCs, the community and technical colleges, you wanted to look more broadly? Well, we just need to be clear about what terms we're using. And Mitch and I have talked a lot about that. I think we're headed towards a place where any training that we, that we incentivize people to take after high school, it needs to be called college. We've, we've reached a point in our society where we as parents all want our children to quote, go to college. But what does that actually mean? What, what we think it means in, in this economy is that 
that students gain a skill set that makes them marketable in our economy. Maybe that's a four-year degree, maybe that's an associate's degree, maybe that's a commercial driving license, maybe it's a plumber's license. I work at one of the largest law firms in West Virginia and we will routinely circulate emails in our office asking for references for plumbers, electricians, HVAC technicians, because those people aren't to be found. They're, they're, they're in, they're, the, the, their waiting lists are weeks long to get those people to come service your homes. So. All, all we're talking about now is terminology. All right, very quickly, you put out an op-ed piece, uh, uh, Senator, and uh, you're calling for charter schools, education, savings accounts, differential pay. You know that the teachers' unions are adamantly opposed to that. Are, are you ready for another fight this year? Well, I don't think it's a fight. I'm talking about exploring these options because what we know for absolute certainty is the education performance level of our children in this state does not reach the levels that uh, occur in other states. and so. We have great teachers, great kids. We just need to structure a system that it, it capitalizes on all those advantages. Gentlemen, thank you so much. We're, we're out of time. I appreciate both of you being here, and I hope you'll, you'll join us again as the weeks go by. Thanks Our for pleasure. Having us. Thank you so much. Volunteers were recognized today at the Capitol for giving freely of their time and energy to helping others. Here's a comment from the Senate floor. I see several friends here today who have spent the last two and a half years of their life helping uh, us in southern West Virginia recover from the disastrous 2016 flood. Um, and I, I thank you all. Um, I see friends who are here today who spend each day of their lives nurturing our young people. Uh, I see friends here today who spend each day of their lives nurturing the most vulnerable among us in West Virginia. Um, these are folks who need help, and so I would appeal to my colleagues here in the Senate um, who are influencers and who are leaders in their community uh, to please lift up these folks and the opportunities that they provide for service throughout the state. Tomorrow evening, the chairman of the Senate and House Finance Committees will join us, plus we'll have an in-depth report on the Community and Technical College Tuition Assistance Bill. I'm Suzanne Higgins. For everyone here at West Virginia Public Broadcasting, thanks for watching. Have a great evening. Viewers of West Virginia Public Broadcasting programs are more likely to choose a sponsor over a competitor when